what I wanted to do uh, this week is to look at the, um, the current state of the data that's being published. So I've done some very initial uh, investigation to see uh, how well people are conforming to the standards to help give us a sense of where to go next. Um, I wanted to briefly uh, discuss um, uh, data harvesting, um, which is a topic that's come up in a few discussions recently about how to support developers, um, and hopefully have a, a maybe a bit of a discussion around facilities data, um, which again is something that I think a few publishers are looking for support for in the standard, but we haven't yet kind of bottomed out what the requirements are there. Um, so this goal is very much focused on sort of taking stock of the current standards work and where we might want to go next. Um, I'll try and keep some time at the end so if there's anything that anyone wants to raise then we can discuss that in the call as well. So um, as I was saying I was I've been doing a, a bit of investigation it's quite high level initially just to look at um, what data is being published so far um, how well people are conforming to the standards um, and look at how the standards are being used at the moment. Um, so to see which, which aspects of the data model, for example, people are using in the published data. Because what I want to do um, as part of our ongoing work is to drive some of the decisions and prioritization based around um, both new requirements, but also uh, using some insight from the data that's been published. So, for example, if, if it's clear that people need better um, documentation uh, about how to use specific features or they, uh, we need to focus some of our validation tools on supporting publishing certain types of data, um, then it'd be nice to do that based on knowledge that people actually need help in those areas. Um, so to begin with, I've just been um, looking to see um, how many feeds uh, conform to the paging specification and the opportunity data. So at the moment, we've got um, 20 live data feeds. I, I think there are, that's dating for more than one publisher, but it's, there's 20 uh, APIs at the moment. <clears throat> 19 of them um, conform to the specification, at least as far as the structure of the data that's being returned in the APIs. The only one that doesn't conform at the moment is British Cycling. Um, there is a, a bug that's been filed on there um, on their data set, that is a very simple change. They're, they're just missing a, a license, um, just rename one of the keys in the response and they'd be conformant. Um, so that's uh, I think a pretty good state um, to begin with, that people can consistently harvest the data that is being used. Um, in terms of the, the modeling specification, it's, it's more of a mixed, uh, uh, kind of mixed economy at the moment. Um, which is perhaps not surprising given that we, a number of people started to publish data before we'd finished the, the standardization uh, around the data model. So at the moment of the 19 feeds that conform to the, um, the paging spec, eight of them are uh, using the um, open active opportunity data model. And I've listed the ones that are on the, on the page there. Um, the way I've been looking at this initially is just to see whether they um, have declared in their, in their uh, API that they're using the standard model. Um, I haven't yet dug into the detail of the contents of the feeds just to see whether they are applying the model in the, in the right way. So there's, a, there's another layer of kind of validation and checking. Um, but it's good to see that we have um, eight publishers using the model already. Um, the looking at the other um, 11 feeds just to see uh, what uh, whether there's or we'll see where the source of variation is um, there are a couple that are um, uh, actually have just got small errors that would mean that they would be conforming to uh, both specifications so one just has the context property in the wrong location in the feed um, the other one has just um, hasn't quite structured their data pages correctly. So they've kind of mixed up the paging spec and the opportunity model. Um, so in both those cases, it's, I think it's very simple um, changes required to their uh, API templates in order to uh, um, fix that up. So I, 
with a bit of encouragement, we could we could quickly get another two um, added to those lists. Uh, when I was looking today, one of the feeds was empty. Um, I don't know whether that was a point in time Salford, issue. Uh, yeah, it was Salford, yeah. So, uh, so Salford came back to us uh, yesterday and said that they've changed the way their systems work and they've actually blocked the uh, feed from working, which is quite clever. Uh, so they're, I think they're working to resolve that this week. Okay, so that's a known issue. So it'd be interesting to find ways that we can uh, make that more visible to people. Um, you know, how, how would a developer know that that, you know, that was a kind of a temporary outage? Um, yeah, we should raise that on that uh, on the GitHub. You're right, it came direct, but we should have channeled it to GitHub, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, on the, uh, we're, we've got a developer who's working on building an API dashboard, which I mentioned briefly last week. Um, so one of the things we're going to be including on the dashboard is the number of issues that have been reported against the data sets to kind of highlight um, where there may be known issues and, and direct developers to, to kind of look at them. Um, so of setting aside those three, the other eight um, are, using a cust are using custom schemas basically. Um, and from the, the review I've done so far, they all map very closely to the opportunity model. Um, I was trying to get a sense of whether there is um, uh, whether there was any major gaps in what we've developed, um, but I uh, I can't see any at, at this stage. There's certainly um, some variation in the types of data they're publishing. So some of them are publishing events, uh, and some of the feeds are focusing more on clubs or on individual locations, so um, table tennis um, tables. Um, but there is, there is support for all of those in the existing model. Um, what I suspect is that there may be some additional uh, properties or um, yeah, additional properties that, that those publishers may need in order to um, include exactly the same data in their feeds. But um, I, I couldn't see any major issues to stop them from migrating. So the key thing will be just trying to identify what support we can provide them with um, within the program to encourage them to start to um, align with the other publishers um, because the more alignment we get then the um, the easier it's going to be for uh, data users to be able to um, harvest data reliably from uh, multiple sources um, so to, I've done some digging into the um, the feeds that do conform to the opportunity model. Um, I can show you a spreadsheet with some of that the results in that. Um, but just to kind of summarize at a high level, um, there see of those eight feeds, they're all using um, different uh, features of the data model. So I think with with, uh, with a couple of exceptions, I think every property that we've we've identified either in schema.org or that we've defined as part of the project are being used. Um, there is some use of um, a couple of custom properties and some properties that are in our um, beta specification. Um, uh, so that more kind of been proposed properties for the community to use. Um, but most people seem to be um, managing with um, the, the core properties that we've already defined. Um, I was trying to get a sense of what features everyone was using to start to see whether we can identify a, a kind of common subset that we can say that everyone should be supporting. Um, at the moment, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, everyone is publishing uh, names, descriptions, uh, uh, associating events with activities, identifying the organizers, um, the offers associated with the uh, events. So that's um, pricing, etc., and also its location address. Interestingly, most of them are also um, identified uh, using the gender restriction property as well. Um, I haven't looked in the values of that yet, whether it's whether everyone's just using it and it's mixed opportunities, or whether um, there is a kind of gender focus to most of the events. Um, interestingly, there's not a lot of use of the start and end uh, dates and times um, in the events. Um, uh, but there is use of the uh, sub-event structure. So um, that means that people are describing, for example, um, 
more kind of slots or, uh, within a day. So, you know, that there is a swimming lane available, for example, and uh, at certain times, uh, rather than giving detailed start and end times as part of the kind of core feed. I might be able to, to put some color on that. Um, the reason for that would be that I think at least that the um, general grouping of events that occur across weeks where the instances of the event. Um, so with the exception of British cycling, most of these events occur across weeks. Um, and the, the other one apart from British cycling that doesn't have um, that kind of um, pattern at the moment where they don't use sub events, they just use events as car parks. Um, and some feedback we had earlier to this week from um, London Sport uh, and an active project which they're, they're running is that if they do a, a, a distance search of events uh, for a particular area of London, um, then it's all our parks because it's our parks till next year. <laughs> they're all events uh, that are individually um, listed out with every date that they are throughout the world. Um, and so uh, their request was can our parks please align with everyone else and use what is some events so that we can distinguish between the same event that's appearing weekly and just a shed load of events. Um, so there seems to be some convergence around this idea that if you've got something recurring, we'd rather bunch them into sub events rather than just spray them uh, across time so that people can actually um, display them effectively. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Uh, I, I certainly want to have a look at that in a bit more detail. Um, I, I'll switch the spreadsheet in a second. Um, interestingly, most, I think, uh, like five of the eight are, have got uh, coordinates on the data, although everybody, I think, is including um, an address as well. Um, I, I, initially, I was expecting less uh, geocoding, but it, um, it seems like most people are doing it. Um, let me just switch to the, the spreadsheet. I, I'll share these afterwards so that you can have a look yourself. Um, uh, just to explore where, where things are at. Um, but I, I've got a spreadsheet uh, that identifies, um, hopefully you can see this, um, just to make it slightly larger and see if it's a bit easier to read for you all. Um, <clears throat> it lists all of the properties um, that are in the data feeds. So what I've done is I've harvested, um, at, um, for the eight that conform to the opportunity spec, I've harvested um, either the entire feed or a minimum of uh, 2,000 opportunities just to get a kind of uh, a sample uh, across uh, each of the providers and then <clears throat> I've identified all of the properties that they're using in their feed um, to see which ones are actually present so I've got a list of the properties um, then um, just reading across the page the total number of publishers who are using that property in at least one of their um, at least one of their events. Um, I've identified whether that property is part of the data model uh, or it's in the beta namespace or is, is custom. Uh, and then it just like for each of the publishers, it just says, uh, uh, just indicates whether the, the property is in use. Um, so it means we can, we can start to dig, dig into to see if we were interested to see just for example, which properties are being used by um, at least six of the publishers, then we can start to see that, as I was saying, activity, description, gender restrictions, location is included in all of them. Uh, they all have offers, uh, that all but one have organizers, etc. cetera. Um, that includes down to four and five. Then you can start to see this, this sub events. So five of the publishers are using event and sub event for that kind of recurring events. Um, and they're, most, they're mostly putting the, the start and end dates and the durations on those sub events rather than the main opportunity. Um, so the, I think the other good thing to highlight is um, other than, I'll just remove the filters, um, the ones in red are properties that are custom. So they've not been defined in the spec or anywhere else. So uh, there's one publisher that's using this disambiguating description. One is using a venue ID. Um, one is using, yeah, I think it's actually, yeah, one's using gender restriction, but in the wrong location. So um, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing because it means that there isn't a whole set of extra, um, uh, extra custom properties that people are feeling that they need. 
or they're, they're drifting away from the core standard. Um, the beta properties, um, a few are using this the formatted description to include a kind of HTML version of the, the event description, but um, the other properties are only being used by individual individual publishers. Um, so there isn't necessarily a, a kind of obvious alignment around some of these as yet. So we probably need to have more discussion there. Um, so as I say, I'll, I'll share this out so you can you can have a look. And I also want to put more detail to get a sense of how many opportunities are using these um, these properties, so we can understand whether publishers are just using uh, are describing their events in a consistent way, or whether there's a degree of variation in, in the amount of information they have about each of the opportunities. Um, in putting together the list, I've identified there's a, there's a few things that we've standardised as part of phase one that aren't being used at the moment. Um, uh, the one caveat is meeting point. I think it's good Jim are using the beta version of this so they just need to switch over to um, just update their feed to use the uh, the standardized version um, but the attendee instructions the is coached indicator and the accessibility information of the data that I've harvested so far nobody's using those um, so either we need to be highlighting this uh, to the publishers or um, over time if nobody's using these things then maybe we just need to drop them from the, the specification. I don't think that's the case for the accessibility. Um, I think it, we want to encourage people to publish that if they have it um, and if they don't then maybe it's something that they should be um, should be collecting. Um, so that's just a kind of initial kind of um, um, Sorry Lee I was just going to say on, on those things I, th I think it's definitely going to be a, a a, a long time period over which um, people knowing that they've got the op opportunity to share those things, it's going to be a lot of time and a lot of steps to go through before they're in a the position to do that. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, th th I think there are things like, like the accessibility where we want people to be taking that time to adjust their systems and kind of encourage people on. But there are, I think that there's, there might, we might end up with quite a mixed bag of other properties that aren't being, we've discussed, but aren't being used. So we might want to deprecate those. So I think there's just two separate, two separate strands of discussion. Um, uh, so I've mentioned the properties not in use. Um, so that my initial kind of, um, kind of conclusions from that just quite quick review. Um, is um, firstly, I, I think there's some a couple of small changes that we need to be making, probably to the paging spec, um, to uh, include uh, encourage people to include some versioning and, and conformance information in the feeds, um, so it can be clearer about which version of the paging spec and which version of the data model that they um, think that they are following, because um, at the moment you kind of have to uh, use a bit of kind of guesswork, a bit of heuristics on when you're harvesting the data to identify those. Um, some of the issues I've highlighted here will be uh, fairly clear on the dashboard that we are uh, currently building. So the dashboard will say whether feeds, um, yeah, whether the API is conformed to this feeding spe feed spec, whether it conforms to the data model and highlight um, the numbers of known issues. Um, but also, obviously, we need to be thinking about um, better tooling to support validation. Um, once I've gone the kind of next layer down and just kind of looked at the actual values people are putting into those properties, we might give us a bit more insight into how to structure that tooling. Um, and clearly, if we still have uh, 11 publishers who have not adopted the model, uh, we need to understand what we, what we should be doing to support those and um, create some better documentation to support that kind of mapping process for them. Um, within the, the ADI team at the moment, um, we're looking at that as part of the kind of learning and training um, strand of the project. Um, but whatever we can all collectively do to encourage uh, the publishers to adopt the standards would be good. Uh, you know, adding plus ones to issues where we've um, filed them to ask, filed them with the publisher to ask them to uh, fix up or um, adjust their feeds would be good. Um, just using our kind of individual social networks um, would be good as well um, so that we can start to drive up those numbers. 
Uh, so that, that was my kind of quick checking on the state of the of data. Um, any other, any questions or observations on that? No. Okay. Um, in that case, I just wanted to briefly uh, touch on this uh, topic of uh, data harvesting. Um, so, um, the way that the, the the ecosystem is built at the moment um, is we're relying on uh, data harvesting as a way for people to um, access the opportunity data. Um, the reason for doing that and designing the ecosystem that way is um, there are a large number of different publishers who will be contributing um, data. So a, a harvest and then aggregate approach um, uh, makes sense to allow people to pick and choose the sources that they need for their application. Um, that does mean that every, every developer will, unless they're only using data from a single provider, which seems unlikely, that everyone will have the same requirement of being able to harvest data um, to index it uh, locally. Um, so while from a technical point of view, uh, implement, in implementing that is fairly straightforward. Um, what we're interested in, in doing as part of the um, support we're offering to uh, both publishers and consumers is to see whether there is interest in the broader technical community about developing an open source harvester. Um, we've, ha we've had some, uh, some initial conversations with various people in the community who were possibly interested in this. Um, interested in sharing some resources. So we want to see whether we can kind of facilitate those discussions. So we're planning to try and put together a meeting um, on either the 11th or 12th of December, depending on people's diaries, to get some people in a room at the ODI offices uh, to have more of a discussion about that, um, just to see whether we can help um, bootstrap a, an open source library or project that will be beneficial to the community. Um, to make things as uh, open as possible. Um, so if anyone here is interested in that or knows somebody who might be, then um, put them in touch. We'll be putting out um, a general invite to the, the mailing list um, through all the usual channels. But I just wanted to give you a kind of heads up that, um, that we'll be doing that over the next, um, next few days. Um, that's harvesting. Is there anything you want to add to that, Nick? We've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, no, I suppose it's I suppose it's worth highlighting um, that this is different to aggregation, uh, which there are services that do that, um, and uh, that, that harvesting is the first piece of that puzzle. And so the benefit is that uh, if a large number of organisations are um, are sharing the, the burden of, of that bit, um, that that will help with data to conform to the standards more. Um, so the idea being that there's it's a bit like using one web browser to access the internet, or kind of. Uh, bad analogy, but like Safari and Chrome both use the same engine underneath to access the HTML. So if you look at a web page in Safari or in Chrome, it will look quite similar. And that's the kind of thing we're saying here is that aggregators um, uh, will be able to have this access to the same kind of common engine, which means that if someone puts some data out there that's not valid, um, that it will not be valid for anyone. It's not that it will be valid for, you know, the BBC, but not valid for um, someone else, um, uh, Weight Watchers, that's um, called users, um, that it will only work for those that, uh, it will it'll work for everyone on their one, which will then hopefully encourage people to actually um, publish. But yeah, this isn't, so that this isn't about um, trying to um, make an open source um, aggregator that competes with commercial propositions because that just won't um, be sustainable. Yeah, it's, it's just, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, I must admit, I don't really, I don't really know what it is. So, um, that's the best way to describe it. So any developer that starts to use the opportunity data will have to do um, uh, a, a common set of tasks. They'll need to um, uh, go to the individual uh, APIs and collect up all of the the, the opportunities that are currently available from that publisher and then they will regularly need to revisit um, to collect any new data. Um, the information they collect 
will need to be stored locally um, so that they can then uh, use that as part of their applications. Um, so what, for, because we know that that is going to be a common recurring piece of work, we just want to see whether um, creating a, uh, it could be as simple as a client library or it could be something that's more, uh, more, more complete framework help developers get through that process quicker yeah. so they can focus on the application build rather than um, the kind of mechanics of just shuttling data around. Yeah. And, and so in the broader sense, there's um, those that will choose to use aggregators um, like I'm in that exist um, and those that will choose not to and to go their own way and build it all themselves. Um, and so for those that choose not to um, uh, use kind of dead aggregators, this would make sense to help them to, to have a kind of common base to build off of so they're not doing something completely random. Um, yes. But, there's, but it doesn't, what this doesn't do is a lot of the other value add stuff that an aggregator would do. So kind of, I'm trying to balance the like not undermining the, the value proposition that aggregators add to the market, but also yeah, yeah, making it clear that there's a common ground that people can share. Yeah. There is. <laughs> So, uh, so these are, these are some of the discussions that we could be having at at, at the meeting in uh, in December. It's kind of scoping out whether there's um, whether there's interest, whether there's a need, um, and um, how we might go about uh, moving that forward as a as a, as a strand of activity. Um, so I. So keep an eye on time. I'm going to, I'm going to move us on to, unless there's any other comments, on just to have a bit of a discussion around facility data. Um, so this has come up, I think it's come up in a couple of the previous calls, um, and I think some of the mailing list discussions. And I know Nick has spoken to a few people about it as well recently. Um, uh, so I just really just wanted to get a sense from people on the call what uh, what facilities data means to them because uh, it has a meaning to me but i'm not sure it's quite uh, it's quite what uh, people are referring to um so I'd, I'd originally thought that facilities data was actually about the kind of equipment um and other kind of infrastructure that was available at a location um but i think what people are interested in is how to um communicate availability of equipment of squash courts or tables etc as a part of um, what they're publishing in the feed so I, I just wanted to kind of open up and just see uh, what the what requirements people had um, anyone wants to chip in any kind of thoughts on um, what we need to be collecting there oh, Harley. yeah no I'll just chip in on that that's something of a interest to our company uh, and we've looked at a couple of the specifications which we need, and it's more of the second half of things. So the availability of, say, a squash court, um, what times, what times they start taking bookings, what times do they stop taking bookings, and each how long the session kind of runs for, uh, where it is. So not too far off what the session stuff is, just kind of at a fixed location. Um, so that I think. My co-founder James has been talking to Nisha Iman a little bit about what specifications we would need for that. But yeah, it's pretty basic stuff. Um, but yeah, just it's more in terms of when that slot can be booked um, or or even seeing that it's available for uh, someone that wants to say book a squash court for an hour on a Monday at 4 p.m. So from the sporting perspective, we we have active places which are sports facility data. So <clears throat> we talk about facilities being the individual facilities within a site. So that is the sports hall, the swimming pool, or whatever. And we hold a lot of data about that. So there's, there's two bits of that. There's the knowing that those facilities are available. And then there's the issues within that about the configurations around pitches and everything that is around those. So a sports hall could be divided up into typical four court sports hall will have will be able to accommodate four badminton courts um, a five-a-side pitch a basketball court netball court volleyball court etc and it will have and they will all depend on whether they have all the line markings for that as well so the operator would have all that um, information what they would know is depending on how that can be configured that you could run 
if you're going to have badminton, you'll probably have two badminton courts run at the same time, and there'll be a, a line down the middle. They might do be running some other activity around that. Conversely, once you move into bigger sports halls and things like that, six courts and things above, then you can have a completely different configuration because you can have five, you can have five side football running along across four of the badminton courts, and you can have the other two badminton courts still playing badminton. So all the operators within the back end systems will have that configuration. And if that's the kind of conversation around pitch bases, then it's probably we need people like Dan and I can play in the conversation. Done quite a lot of that configuration, particularly when you come to pitches mm. and other stuff. Because yeah. the other one is three, any of the artificial pitches is another one where you'll divide that pitch up quite quite often in peak times during the week, the operator will divide that full size 3G into three seven side pitches. Um, so, yeah, we probably need other pitches, because if that's what we're really talking about, how do you book pitches, then you need that information. Something like squash is fine, because that'll be a one to one relationship. You probably only, not many of them, you have done there are a few double squash court, pretty much in one individual box with one court in it. And, and um, yeah, unless you divide that into two for the exercise or a nursery yeah. or something. Um, and so there's uh, there's a few people I would pr I would channel into this conversation as well who are, I, are not on the call right now. Um, Jamie from my local pitch will be one of those, um, and also Raymond um, from Clarity Live. I know has mentioned some stuff on, on previous calls, um, and uh, and I know that and also um, oh, who are the guys that. Um, there's, there's another, there's a play football user provider that I've set my mind, but yeah, those guys as well. Um, and uh, there's basically, using, seems to be two ways to do this at a high level, just to kind of give you a scale of the problem that we're talking about. Um, the uh, two ways of doing it are either we expose the complexity that Nick just described, which is there is one square, there is one space that can be divided into three or into five or into seven or divided by whatever, depending on the metrics, and try and put a standard around that so everyone can see how you divide the spaces up. Um, and it gets hugely complicated because, you know, a half a basketball court is a, is usable, but a quarter of a basketball court isn't usable for basketball and it's different for badminton and all this kind of stuff. So the rules around it, the business rules are really complex. The other approach and the one that Jamie favored from My Local Pitch is that the, the and, and I think Raymond was, I think on the same page, but it's probably worth a further discussion. Um, is that actually just expose the offers as they are and allow the uh, systems to do the business rules themselves. So what that would mean is instead of saying there is one sports hall which can be divided 50 different ways, actually say there are two half badminton courts, one badminton, sorry, two half, half basketball courts, one basketball court, four badminton courts, all available. And as soon as you book a half badminton, a half basketball court, then two of the badminton courts disappear. Right. So it's almost saying, you know, there are there are connected products and the availability is surfaced. Um, but the complexity behind that availability of all of these different configurations isn't surfaced so that you don't need to worry about whether that badminton court is in the same place as the basketball court. Um, you just operate on the basis of one. And that allows apps like Played, uh, Tom or, or a Monocle Pitch to just surface, you know, uh, a half basketball court uh, or Woober, in fact, is a basketball app. Um, just surface the half basketball court and allow that to be booked um, because and, and because of the complexity we just discussed extracting that data from these systems so we're doing work with Gladstone and Fusion um, that that is actually quite a difficult task because you can imagine the way that the data is represented within the system is a lot more difficult than just the availability data which is there's a table it's got number of spaces available all the time the day you know you can just expose it and it's a one-to-one -one mapping between that and the standard this is probably going to require a bit of translation between the internal representation and all its complexity and whatever is in the, the standard. Um, but I guess you, you were, so this is just exposing some of the, the, the challenges that we've got to face. And I guess the question is, when are we going to face those challenges and, and how are we going to collaborate to, towards that solution? And I, mean, I, I would agree with Nick that you, you leave the, the operator is the best person who knows how they configure their center and, and release the data. So you, you're effectively releasing slots. So if everyone knows what that slot is, um, that's fine. They know they can book a badminton court, book a thing. The challenge is more about when you talk about opportunity and things like that, as if operators will only, will again, push out the things that will make them the most money. So if they keep pushing, what, what, what I'm getting to the point is, if we keep 
if you leave it too much in there, if you only show what's there at the moment, there is also the opportunity about how do you show that that facility could potentially be booked for badminton or could be booked for basketball. It's actually got a call there. Because if you are a basketball team looking for someone to play, mm. then you want to know that that facility will offer that opportunity, mm. even if you might not find it available at that particular slot. So there's a bit of a challenge of how you yeah. navigate how, that. How you navigate that bit. Mm. Yeah, but there's presumably there's a there's a, there is a kind of there's a way to expose that without necessarily exposing all of the complexity around configurations. I mean, just knowing that at a particular venue, these are all of the activities that can that it will support is one approach. You know, just knowing that the, you can do basketball in a location implies they've got a basketball court. Um, We've got even if there's not. We've got leaders quite a lot of that already on active places, so because we've captured a lot of that data. So a lot of the formal ones, it will tell you you can it's got number of in each facility ID, it will tell you it's got X number of badminton courts, X number of um, basketball courts or whatever. And we've also got a list of we started to get them to populate the kind of activities that can, and and also the equipment's available there as well for other activities that could take place there. But it's the it's the could versus what. I, I suppose the question to ask Tom and then I can channel Jamie in the response as well would be what is the requirement uh, from, from Tom's perspective and, and, and I can think from other perspective. Is it just there's a basketball court here or is there more to it than that? Um, is there a basketball uh, There's more to it than that um, for our kind of use case. So uh, is there a basketball here would be a good starting point. Um, however, that information is, is seemingly out there from what we've kind of discovered already. Um, it's more to do with the availability and uh, from your point before, I think the second option seems to make the most sense by quite far. Um, what that would mean for us would, we just need to know whether that time slot was available at that time. So if I try and put it into perspective, so if there's a sports hall which could take say four badminton slots or if, there, if it was one basketball court, it would just show on both kind of so if someone searched basketball or someone searched badminton that session would show on both sides and as the booking whichever kind of was the first booking would the system would kind of work out what the availability was um, i'm not sure that sounds quite complex from your guys end but that would be exactly what we would need um, just to show the it not kind of cross over just to show as the search term was basketball say squash um, which they'd come up on both things for the same facility and then the user, whoever booked it first, I guess would kind of set set how that went. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, I, I, but I'm, I'm wondering how much of the existing um, model actually covers this. Um, because if we're mostly talking about um, offers, uh, I think we can already say that there is an offer in a particular location and that the offer is um valid from start and end times we can say what the availability is around that offer and the price um what what is it that's missing that that would need to be in there to support your use case it would be i think most of that stuff will be around side of because you're gonna if you're trying to book football you want to know can i buy and what am i booking am i booking a five aside court a five aside pitch a seven aside a nine aside or a full size, mm -hmm. and the price will vary between them. I and the price should tell you, you get an idea for the price that will be available because you know, full size pitch is probably about a thousand an hour, roughly. Um, and it's in London. So, yeah, you, it's, although the activity is there in certain, certain activities, so certain activities can take place anywhere, and therefore you, that's where you're booking the slot. Other ones, they are very much tied to a facility, and the size of the game is influenced by that. Yep. Yeah, okay. I, I can see that, but I, I suppose I'm struggling to see how that's just not a, a variety of different offers. Yeah, but I suppose it, it, once you get through to the booking, then it, it has to be, well, five or so. It depends if we haven't got the, when we go back to the activity list and where we, we click to it. I suppose there's a bit of that, whether it is a top five, you know, what it is. You also might be interested in, you know, I'm booking something here, and football's another one, because you say, my preferred surface is a 3G. Three, three, three 
artificial pitch and I don't want to play on a sand dress. Well, it's hockey will turn around. If I want to play hockey, I want to play on a sand dress pitch. But there are some other bits and nuances around them. Probably you haven't yet picked up. I was kind of saying that the, the attributes of the activity as well. I can I can see what you, you mean though in just thinking, looking at the model in my mind there, <laughs> uh, whether you could just use some events to represent the slots and you could just use uh, the activity list to represent seven aside and just have an extra category of activity in there um, and then use categories to represent uh, the types of pitches. There probably is a kind of rough mapping. I mean, maybe it's just a case of us calling that out specifically and then if there's extra attributes that are probably more useful explicitly like surface which i know sorry just cut off there a little bit for me nick um yeah i think it's not a million miles away from the session data in terms of the specs which would be needed so there's a few nuances but what I'll do is I can share a list of the specs that would be good for our case and see if that how how, how that matches up with the session, uh, session specs. But it's not a million miles away, and um, except for a few nuances um, revolving yeah, no, stuff like surface type and things like that, um, I don't think it's a million miles away. So I'll, I'll share something with the group which gives an indication of what we need um, or what we'd like to have as part of that data set. Uh, and see if that matches up with Jamie's and, and, and see how far it is. But from, I don't think it's a million miles away if, from what I've seen. Okay, that's great. I think if we, can get, if we can get some concrete examples from you and others, then we can see, we can actually just try it out. How, how, well, how does it look when we put it into the existing model? Where, where have we hit in uh, cases that we need um, more properties or, or to think through? Um, and I think, Nick, we could probably do the same thing with the active places data. Um, the, I know that there's a, there's a lot of detail in some of the facilities description that we haven't dealt with. Um, you know, I, I keep coming back to the, um, the details that you've got in there around um, uh, cycle tracks, for example. Um, so there's a I think maybe just a question that whether we whether we need to incorporate all of that in the the opportunity model um, or whether it's enough just to say okay active places exist as openly licensed data and just point people to that um, as you know as a resource rather than kind of republishing it yeah I think you just push people well you can push people to it and it's, it's more about <coughs> if we haven't discussed it are there some critical fields around the opportunity stuff that go across facilities as well um, yeah, I mean, it probably just needs to be, you can reference it back in the, in the thing to have a look at. And we've got a kind of thing. And we want to improve our data model anyhow, so there's a bit of, there might be a bit of an kind of opportunity to have a look at that, depending on what comes out of these conversations again. Okay, interesting, okay. Um, I, the other thing that I'm kind of just thinking we haven't done now is, is documented, like how would you, for example, reference and something that is in active places as a venue within your opportunity data feed to start to kind of link those two data sets together mm. um, for somebody who is, you know, who might be using both sources. So that's something that we can include in the, um, the documentation. Yeah, because we've had, we've had a conversation about with GDS about that becoming one of these registers. Oh, okay, right, interesting. So if that became, then that would, that would kind of surface it more up to the operators then to include the site IDs and everything within that. Mm. And that could be then. Yeah. It'd take a bit of a longer burn, but it would be yeah. a way of addressing that issue. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it'd be some interesting challenges to fit it into that registers model, but it'd be great, great to see it. Um, um, ju just one more thing to flag on this. Um, the, although the model might match the modeling spec, I'm just thinking about the logistics and the volume of feeding that stuff through the paging spec. We might need some rules around what bits of the model we expose, or maybe they're not rules, maybe we just let this happen organically, but I'm just thinking. If you imagine a, the current way it works is that you would push the whole um, event with its sub-events every time that there's a, a uh, change made to the bookings so the availability updates. Um, now, if that happened with a slots situation for a squash for all these products, because obviously we're taking something as simple as a sports hall, dividing it into 20 different combinations of products, pushing out the availability of all those products with all the different slots, and then if one updates, they all update. And so there might be quite a high volume of, of data 
flying back and forth if we package it up in the modeling spec without giving some ability to almost say, you know, the first time you receive this, it's a full model. And then maybe you only have, there's a partial, there's a way of having a partial update. The model, I know the modeling spec doesn't really do this at the moment, but like a, you, you don't want to pass the whole uh, 20 products back and forth every time there's a single booking, ideally. I'm assuming you just want to pa pass the partial relating to the change that's been made or something. Um, because with, with opportunities, there's not the same problem because the, um, the volume is much smaller. It's one-to-one-ish. Yeah, yeah, we just need some, we did some rules in the, in the spec around that. But, you know, we could be just indicating uh, status on sub-events to indicate that slots have been deleted without necessarily having to communicate. Um, you, you know, retransmit every, all of the data, as you were saying. Um, but uh, this, this is where I think it's useful just to get into trying out trying out the existing model with some actual data and then we can see what it actually looks like in practice. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah my, my point was uh, make it look like how it looks in practice, but also how it would be transmitted on the update on the updates. So it's like both in the fourth dimension and the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're agreeing, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That stuff. yeah it would need to be a set of work examples of here's what it looks like and then what would be the changes be and how would you, um, mm. how would you reflect that? Yeah. Okay, uh, that's been useful, useful input. Um, uh, and I'll follow up with a couple of you, uh, three of you with Tom and Nick, talk about active, uh, and active places and also on the um, example data. Um, you follow up with Jamie on that as well. I know that he couldn't make this call, but is interested in that in the last call. Yes, I will do, yeah. yeah. I think he previously provided some stuff. I can't remember whether he sent that to me or to the list, but um, I'll look that out as well. Um, so we can start a discussion thread around it on the on the mailing list. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're nearly out of time. Was um, before I kind of just review uh, what we'll do in the next couple of calls. Is there anything else that anyone wants to raise today? Hi there. So yeah, no, I'm just actually looking at the specifications that we've got on ours at the moment, um, and I guess because it's a fixed place, which isn't really going to change. So it just needs to describe what that space is. I guess it gets a bit more complicated complicated when it's a sports all divided but for say a football pitch which is seven aside that's not really going to change um, as per say the facilities ideal scenario so they say a facility would usually rent out three seven aside pitches or one 11 aside pitch I guess that needs to be predetermined from their side and then any changes to that kind of fall outside the model because um, from from what I've known and what I've, they they're, they're they were going to uh, rent it out in that way. So they're going to, majority of the time, some some guys on this call might know different, but majority of the time they're going to rent those three separate seven aside because that generates the most revenue and is the most popular format for that. So if it, if you, if it gets to a point where the providers say, right, this is our ideal format, this is how we sell it. And there's a couple of things in terms of like surface, um, opening times and car parking, things like that, which are fixed and aren't going to change much. I think that might be a bit of an easier way to display the facility data on, on platforms like ourselves. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I mean, if we can get you, if we can send through kind of pointers to things that's on your platform or just example data to the list, I think that will help, help a great deal. I'm unmuted. Yeah, I'll send that over to you guys. Uh, I've just got it all listed out now, so yeah, I can send over um, some some kind of inf uh, examples of that, and it might make it a bit more comprehend. Cool. Okay. Um, so we've got uh, two more calls that I've uh, scheduled in uh, before the end of the year. Um, so the next one will be on the in two weeks' time on the 29th of November. Um, the main focus of that will be talking about how we move the activity list forward. Um, I raised that last week as something that we really need to kind of rethink how we're approaching it. Um, uh, so I want to have uh, part of that discussion with the group uh, on the 29th. Um, but as I suggested last time, uh, I want to try and get together a kind of face-to-face -face, uh, workshop um, to, to really try and push forward on that and address some of the issues around um, ownership and management of the list as well as uh, some of the detail on the, the current structure. 
Um, also on the 29th, um, we're hoping to do a, a quick demo of the API dashboard that um, we're currently building, um, just so you can see uh, how that is developing. Um, then the, the call after that will be on the 13th of December, um, and there we want to focus that on booking. Um, so looking at what the current landscape is around uh, booking in the sector, what APIs people are using, um, start the discussion around uh, what requirements people have had. Um, by, that, by that call, uh, we'll have done some research at the ODI that we can share what we've learnt. So we start to have more of a discussion um, and move that, uh, that booking aspect forward as well. Um, I'll uh, schedule the, um, the calls for the new year um, in the next week or so. Um, but those are the kind of things that we'll focus on between now and the end of the year, um, activity list and booking. Um, so I think that was it for today's call. Um, I'll hopefully, Nick, you can get the video up uh, for anyone who uh, couldn't make it today. Um, I will also post the uh, slides and the spreadsheet that I showed to the list so that you can uh, have a look at those as well. Uh, so. I think that's it. Um, thank you all again for, for coming along and um, uh, providing input today. It's been really useful. Thank you. Um, and I'll speak to you all in a couple of weeks. Right. Cheers, everyone. Bye. See you later, guys.